Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com. I'm here on Facebook doing a live on a Friday night here in the UK and uh, I actually have my gin and tonic as promised, uh, Hendrix and uh, Elderflower tonic so I hope you're joining me with a drink wherever you are in the world maybe it's coffee <laughs> if it's a bit earlier in the day so very excited to be here again doing a uh, Q&A um, what's I'm in this um software that brings in all the questions so I can see your comments that you post and the questions and I'm going to answer them if they're short enough I'm going to bring them on screen uh, so if you write a really long one it won't be able to go on screen but essentially uh, hopefully you will be able to ask questions this evening please post them uh, as we go and I will hopefully get to them all so we are going to start I'm going to go right to the top. Okay, here we go. So Nuria asks, perhaps this is a silly question, but do you buy your own ISBNs and how do you manage to sell in stores? Uh, um, thank you. <laughs> so basically, yes, I do now, but I didn't for about the first eight years of being an independent author. You certainly don't need to buy your own ISBNs in order to sell as an indie, as a self-published author. So for example, you don't, you don't need ISBNs uh, in fact, even now, um, Ingram Spark, which used to require you to have your own ISBNs, now you can get uh, free ISBNs through uh, Ingram Spark. But in terms of me, yes, I do buy my own ISBNs, and then I use ingramspark.com to get my books uh, into the wide distribution network. So in terms of, uh, oh, and <laughs> John says, I have a G&T local gin, I'd, and then it just disappeared. So I'll come back to that later, John. Cheers. <laughs> Uh, but in terms of getting your books into bookstores, what it when, when you distribute wide with print with Ingram Spark, that doesn't necessarily mean well, no, it doesn't mean that your book is going to be in a bookstore. It does mean you will be in the catalog. So, so um, they can order your book into the bookstore. They can also order it into libraries and uh, universities. And so that is the way to do it. And how uh, we generally do it, those of us who've been doing this a while, is you publish your print book uh, twice, basically. You print, you do it on Amazon, so KDP print. And that means the print books that sell directly on Amazon, uh, it's better to do it that way. And then on but you do not check the extended distribution button. And then you also publish on Ingram Spark uh, with the same ISBN. And that will, yes, it will give you another copy on Ingram, but it will also get you into all those catalogs. So uh, the answer is basically ingramspark.com. Okay, fantastic. Let's get on to the next one. Uh, I'm just going to scroll to the bottom there. Yes, John says, local gin, Duca Genie from Kosovo. Fantastic. And in fact, um, Kosovo, I just interviewed a wonderful uh, author about Kosovo. That will be coming up on my books and travel podcast in probably next month. Okay, so uh, Shari asks, um, I'm taking my first series wide. Oh, wait, I'm going to put it on the screen and to broadcast. There we go. I'm taking my first series wide. I've been in KU for a year, wondering if you had any advice. Going Kobo, Overdrive for Libraries and After Digital. Okay, so uh, first of all, you know, if you've been in KU a year and you've got a series, that is a great time to go wide. As I always say, if you just have one book and you're just starting out, it is really hard. But if you have a series, fantastic. Another question I would say is, do you have box sets? Because I find that actually box sets do really well, um, particularly uh, Kobo and um, Apple, I've done well with uh, doing promotions on box sets on both those. In fact, Kobo, my income crazy is really skews towards box sets. Um, so that is something. So in terms of ideas, there are store specific promotions. So draft to digital advertise these or Kobo has a specific promo tab. So if you don't have access to that, then just email the team and you will be able to get access to that. And that's basically what I do. Every three weeks I go into 
Kobo and apply for all these different promotions. And um, then in terms of advertising for wide books, then you've got obviously BookBub is still the big one, but you don't have to get a deal. You can also do the small pay-per-click BookBub ads, which can be great. Like I've just been running ads to Apple and Kobo without even running them for Amazon. Facebook ads, obviously. And then uh, Dave Chesson from Kindlepreneur has a fantastic page with lots of links for free and bargain books. And most of those, many of those promote uh, wide books, not just KU. So there's a massive ecosystem for wide promotion now. Also, I want to uh, point you to a Facebook group called Wide for the Win. And I've just joined that and um, excited to see what's going on there. And that's also got representatives from different companies in. So that might be useful, Shari. Okay, right, let's do the next one. Um, oh, I just wanted to put this one in, Amanda um, said, Amanda says, it's time for me to stop hiding. Been writing since 2002, I guess. Time to search for editing help, I'm ready. I really love this question. This I don't. It's not not so much of a question, but a comment from Amanda here. I really love that she has said, um, you know, I'm. It's time for me to stop hiding. I think so many of us feel this way. I certainly do. And in fact, uh, my friend and wonderful author Michael Brent Collings put a comment here earlier. Um, I've been talking to him about my own fiction, about how I feel like I've been hiding for a decade, <laughs> as Joe Francis Penn. Uh, I've been sort of holding back with my fiction um, promotion because of so many uh, fear issues and imposter syndrome and all the best. I need to reread my own mindset for authors, but I also feel like this is a really good thing, Amanda. So in terms of editing, uh, I have the website um, on my site, thecreativepen.com forward slash editors is a good place. There's a whole list there of um, editors that you can use. Okay, just have a little sip of gin. <laughs> it is Friday night. If you're, if it's not Friday night where you are, then um, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> and it does look like a bucket, but it does have quite a lot of tonic in. Okay, uh, let's pop down. Um, all right, so uh, John, I'm not going to put it on the comment on screen because it's got an email on <laughs> and this will go all over the internet. Uh, so John says, which is better, Archway or Matador or self-publishing? Also, the literary consultancy, is it worth the money? So these are this is a question about whether various self-publishing companies or consulting companies are worth the money. I can't personally tell you about these companies because I have not used them. <laughs> but what I would recommend for anyone who has questions like this, go to the uh, selfpublishingadvice.org, which is the Alliance of Independent Authors blog. You don't have to pay that, the blog is completely free. Obviously being a member has other benefits, but uh, you can go there and look up these companies. So you can look up Matador, which I believe is a partner member of the Alliance. Um, I'm not gonna comment on Archway, you can look them up. Uh, the Literary Consultancy, I've certainly known people there and they seem very good, but I have never used them. So I can't endorse them. You just need to go check that on Ally. Okay, right, scrolling down, there are a few uh, comments there, please do. Oh, <laughs> Kathy says, I won't be joining you for gin and tonic because it's two in the afternoon here. <laughs> well, it is Friday, Kathy. <laughs> All right, so let's put um, this one. All right, so Kathleen says, when you are relaunching yourself as an author, is it wise to begin with a new series? Okay, this is a really good question and it's going to depend what you mean by relaunching. So some people, so Brian Cohen, for example, is a good example. He had a series of superhero books and he renamed them, recovered them. I believe he put them out under the same name, but basically relaunched with the same books. And I've also done the same. In fact, I'm about to do this do it again <laughs> with uh, oh, this side, um, Desecration, Delirium and Deviance. I'm in the process of getting new covers and I'm going to relaunch that series into a new subgenre, do some advertising around it, see if it sticks better in psychological thriller. And this is something I've been really thinking about for a while because it just hasn't 
found its place and that is that's called cross genre writing <laughs> a lot of the time but um so i'm i'm not relaunching myself as an author i'm relaunching the series so you've said is it better to begin with a new series i think if that that is more likely if you are going to say you write um children's books and you want to move into uh, historical for example then yeah you need to write a new series um, if you want to change your author name you can do that um, and keep your reviews you might need to talk to the various services but um, when you're so I would say Kathleen there's a lot of sort of more detailed questions that I would need to know about relaunching um, uh, in terms of answering that one Okay, next, following it down. Ah, oh, this is fun. I, I always slightly dread live things because I worry so much and I get sort of anxiety, social anxiety, even though, I mean, I know there are people here and I get this kind of fear, but once I'm here, I relax. The gin probably helps. Mm. Right, Nuria. Uh, I can't read, I'm not, it's a very big question, so I'm not going to put it all on the screen, but basically I've been following your work for 10 years. Fantastic. Thank you, Nuria. I write uh, in, I'm a Catalan writer known for Catalan poetry. And yeah, the market for Catalan would be very small. If people don't know, it's, it's not Spanish. <laughs> it is a, a different language, but um, Nuria says I could also write in Spanish. I do think that writing in Spanish now and being an indie in Spanish is probably a really good thing because it's very underserved. It's an underserved market, not just in Spain. I know the Spanish Sp Spain, Spanish in Spain and Spanish in the US and Spanish in Latin America is different but um, I, I think there would be a way to do sort of translation for that but certainly the US market is underserved in Spanish and I believe so is the Spanish in Spain <laughs> if you get what I mean. Uh, so should I change my pen name? I don't think so. Um, you know, unless you no, I, I can't see why, um, you know, should I get another agent? Look, I can't advise you about publishing in Spanish because I, I have had a book out in Spanish years ago and haven't since. But um, I think it is a really underserved market. So give it a go, Nuria. OK, uh, Elizabeth says um, I'm writing my spiritual testimony starting at 15. I'm writing in third person. And am I doing this right? Um, what category would this be? Okay, so, um, and uh, again, I'm not going to put it on the screen. It's a very big comment. Elizabeth has given some examples of her writing. But what I've said here is, um, I don't know, I don't write spiritual testimony. There is obviously a religious and inspirational category on the bookstores. What I would say is, uh, the this is a question for, ev you know, for everyone. This is recommendation for everyone. And why, like, I'm repositioning... <laughs> Uh, these books is find books that are like yours and see where they are. Um, so I would say a spiritual testimony might be a religious memoir, for example. Um, and I would say it's written in first person, you know, possibly in third person. But certainly if it is a testimony, I believe that's true, as opposed to a novel, for example, which is, you know, you could write a Christian novel, but then it would be uh, fictionalized, for example. So I would find the best way to do this is to find books like yours, find other spiritual testimony books and see how they do it. Also, Elizabeth says, how can I keep my tenses straight? I know this can be hard and that's why I recommend a tool like Pro Writing Aid, which I have a tutorial on Pro Writing Aid and um, that is just fantastic. I, I just went through Map of the Impossible with that before sending it to my proofreader. So that's very, very helpful. Okay. Boop, boop, boop. Going down. Oh, there's a few, there's a lot, lots of comments. Okay. Mark. Um, oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> John is not John. John is Alexandra <laughs> posting from her husband's account. Oh, so John's not having the gin. Uh, Alexandra is. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, let's look at Mark's question. I love your sharing of valuable practical information, both free and paid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is how best to attract people of varied interest, capture the varied interest in my email list. I have a novel and two nonfiction books coming out. 
Is the key to have a checklist of interest on every landing page? Okay, Mark. I mean, obviously this is something I went through in the early days and decided to have two brands, mainly because the audience is so varied. Um, and you have used the word varied here, so it will depend how varied. So for example, with Books and Travel, my other podcast, um, I'm intending to write non-fiction under Joe Francis Penn, under JF Penn. So travel memoir, potentially actual non-fiction travel books, maybe um, some other, I have lots of ideas for non-fiction under JF Penn that would fit kind of with my fiction audience. So I would say you are really gonna have to decide what works with the people you want to talk to the most. So for example, with the non-fiction books, do you have a business around the non-fiction? Do you have other forms of income like I have the tutorial I just mentioned on Pro Writing Aid. I'm an affiliate so it's well worth me promoting that tutorial and uh, I use the tool myself so it's all very ethical and wonderful and they're a great company. So that would be my question for you. Uh, how are you intending to make income with these books? Uh, often with if you have one novel and two non-fiction it sounds like you're more on the non-fiction side at least for now. So I would say a good idea is to have a website site under your name that is a good start and then you could just have different tabs and you could have two different li you know list sign up pages one for fiction one for non-fiction that might be the way to go all right okay Byron says, to follow Nuria's question, oh, look, we're having like a conversation <laughs> uh, about Ingram Spark. I understand Ingram Spark will automatically load up a page on Amazon since it's my first book and I'm going to do KDP for 90 days. Do you know whether one overrides the other? Okay, so I am not. Um, so, uh, all right. So you've said KDP for 90 days. It's KU, Kindle Unlimited. And um, I do not do ebooks on Ingram Spark. So I, for ebooks, I directly upload my ebook to Amazon and I do not do KU. But it sounds like you want to do KU, which is you are exclusive to Amazon for 90 days. Now, anyone can use KDP. You just don't have to be exclusive, which is how I do it, for example. So um, I would say don't use Ingram Spark for eBooks. You use Ingram Spark for print. And if we're now talking about print, there is no exclusivity on print. So you can do both, not a problem. And then what happens with the Ingram Spark version of the print book is that there are just two editions on Amazon. And if you use use the same ISBN or even if you have a different one they're just there so if you go to um, my book Stone of Fire for example on Amazon drop down on the print on the paperback you'll see different versions of the paperback not a big deal I don't know about the ebooks because uh, I don't use that on Ingram oh very serious isn't it <laughs> for a Friday mm. okay Dave says, you mentioned recently that a non-fiction second edition would be better as an audiobook. Did you mean instead of as well as in book form and why would that be? Okay, I think maybe this was in my uh, Patreon Q&A. Someone had said they were doing an audiobook on the first edition when they had a second edition coming out and they hadn't finished the audiobook yet. All I meant was, if you bring out a second edition of any book, people are more likely to buy the second edition. And what happens with the audiobook is, you, that's not linked to the second edition. It will be linked to the first edition and you're not going to be able to move that to the second edition. So all I meant by that was if you're bringing out a second edition, you'll need to do an audiobook for that if you want to sell. And most people will buy the latest edition of a book. Okay, Byron says, hello. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Okay. Janelle says, um, how are you finding taking a more forward planned approach to your novels? I find plotting tough, so I like to plan. <laughs> okay, so what I'm doing, and I have been, in fact, I've got here, and I don't know if I mentioned this last time, I've got Outlining Your Novel by Katie Wyland, K.M. Wyland. I've also got uh, Take Off Your Pants by the lovely Livy Hawker uh, on my desk because I'm really trying... Oh, I tell you, I'm just sharing my books with you. Uh, I've also got another one in my massive pile down here that I'm really enjoying. Here it is. 
sorry about the camera there. Elizabeth George, uh, from idea to novel, mastering the process. I listened to this on audio and I bought it in hardback because it's so good. So basically, I am I'm pretty happy with my plotting. What I wanted to do was better positioning, and uh, hence the issues <laughs> that I have with these books is that I never really spent time positioning them before publishing. So what I'm doing is I've been going through these books, and this is for my next uh, arcane thriller, Tree of Life. So I have the title, I have the some of the locations, I know the vague theme, but for the first time I've written a blurb, and uh, so I've written the back matter. Uh, for that book and I've got a cover designed and I might even do a pre-order. I'm a little scared of putting up a pre-order because normally I only put up a pre-order when I finish the first draft but I want to commit to getting it out on a certain day so uh, we will see. So my the answer Janelle is I'm finding it a challenge but also really interesting and I hope that it will mean that my process is uh, cleaner towards the end in terms of my timings. You know, I often just get to this point where my timings fall apart. So I want to try and do that forward planning in terms of the blurb. And I have already slightly changed what I thought the novel would be based on the blurb because I was able to write a stronger blurb. And if you haven't listened to the interview with JD Barker yet, then um, listen to that because he talks about it in there. Right. Okay. Margaret says, Margaret says after I have a little sip. Okay. Margaret says, should a writer consider doing audiobooks with the first book in a series or wait until there are a couple of books into the series? Oh, good question, Margaret. It's going to depend on your budget. It's going to depend on your plan for audiobook. I mean, with the Map Walker series, um, my uh, Map Map of Shadows being the first one. I haven't done the audiobook and only like two days ago I went on to Find Away Voices and uh, uploaded that manuscript. So I'm going to now do the trilogy in audio and I'm glad I waited because I did have to do some slight edits on Map of Shadows for some different uh, terminology I used and I wanted to change that. So that's difficult to change once the book is in audio. So I guess it depends on how confident you are, how much of a budget you have. Um, is it your first book full stop? In which case, don't do an audio book. Definitely wait. Um, there's no harm in waiting, especially because, of course, if you have more books in a series, it's much easier to promote. So you're going to get your money back faster. Hope that helps. Uh, okay, yeah, Byron said, sorry, I meant KU, not KDP. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, oh, another audio question. Paul says, is there any wisdom in publishing a book in audio first, then later, if successful, going backwards to ebook or print? Okay, well, interesting question. And I do have an example of this, um, the book Storyteller, which is all about audiobook narration, which uh, is fantastic if you want to do audiobook narration. Uh, so they already had an, it was an audio first product. And in fact, it was because I said, I wanted a transcript that they even did a paperback which is basically the transcript so uh, I would say if you have an audience in audio so this was um, done by Lorelai King who has an uh, who's a very famous narrator and has an audience in audio um, but if you publish a book in audio first you have to do it, it it's still slightly more difficult to do promotions for audio and why I guess I'm just saying why would you do this unless you have an audio first audience in which case go for it um what I would say is you would have to go through find away voices um ACX you require uh an an uh, ASIN ASIN uh which means you have to have the book available in ebook or print first so hopefully that helps. But I do think this audio first idea is going to become more popular. Okay. Margaret says, what are box set secrets? How to create one? Do cover designers know how to make a box? Is there a template? Okay, so, <laughs> all right. It's not a box set. I think that half the issue with 
indie with the indie space even the word indie itself you know the language we use is often a hangover from the past from traditional publishing so when we say ebook box set we don't mean a box at all it's just a 3d cover yes cover designers know how to do them uh, and in terms of a template you can always just buy one and have a look but for example my ebook box sets are three books in a one file so they download one book and it's got three books in it. It's a bit like buying the Lord of the Rings trilogy and you get those three books in it. Uh, so then yeah there, there are no boxes. I do have some physical, um, what do they call it? I always forget because uh, someone remembers what the word is for physical box set. Not It's not an anthology, it's like there's a word anyway for um, uh, printed edition of three books in one book but I have never used a box I don't know anyone who does use a box so don't worry about that I hope that makes sense I know the language is difficult uh, okay Julie says hi Julie Julie says, I'm venturing into Amazon ads for my first novel. Do you use tools like Publisher Rocket and data scraping or do you get them via manual research? Bit of both really, Julie. Um, to be honest, I think Publisher Rocket is brilliant. Um, Dave Chesson, as I mentioned before, and uh, I do have an affiliate link if you'd like uh, to get um, uh, publisher rocket at my link it's thecreativepen.com forward slash rocket and I do use it for my ads I um, I've been doing them also myself um, recently so yes absolutely I also do some manual stuff you know if I find authors that I think right I should be looking at targeting them I will obviously enter those in but I definitely use publisher rocket that is my number one Amazon ads tool to be honest and all the best with those Okay. Oh, Bo says, love your books. Thank you so much, Bo. I really appreciate that. Okay, Robert. Oh, no, this is Christy. <laughs> All these people using other people's profiles is hilarious. What is the advantage to using a company like Draft or Digital and losing 15% versus formatting and posting myself? Okay, Christy. Well, the main thing, I imagine that you're American for a start. Uh, or British, because um, most people around the world can't actually use many of the platforms themselves. So, um, and in fact, Apple, until about three weeks ago, you couldn't publish direct onto Apple unless you had a Mac. So that kind of excluded a lot of people. Uh, so the advantage to using draft to digital is one, for many people, it's not possible to go direct to these companies. So even Amazon, for example, doesn't pay to some countries in the world or it's too expensive. Um, uh, so that's, you know, one reason. Another reason is because when you get to the stage like me of having 32 books, every time I update, say, the back matter or um, the covers, uh, I have to go into, I use five different ebook platforms plus two uh, print platforms, plus two audio platforms. So that is a lot of updating. And so uh, if you are doing a sort of publishing strategy from day one, which of course I haven't because I've grown uh, every year, you know, from 2008, I just have joined the latest one every single year. <laughs> so you're very lucky to come in now and have a choice. Uh, but essentially it saves time. And so it might be worth that money. And they have a lot of different tools and promotional opportunities. So most people use an aggregator to save them time in terms of publishing. So that hopefully that answers that. Okay. And again, uh, I've lost what your name is now, but this is not John. <laughs> Uh, when listening to the recent interview, how much things have changed? Have are you updating your author blueprint? Uh, I up, I do update the blueprint every six months. So I updated it last in. Um, I should probably update it again. I updated it in January 2020. So I update it a couple of times a year. And uh, if you haven't um, if you haven't downloaded the latest edition, you ca you can. It's still the original download link, which I'm not going to share here. If you want to sign up for my blueprint, go to thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. And basically that is loads of stuff about writing and publishing and um, 
book marketing and making money. What I have also done, Successful Self Publishing, is in its whatever it is, number edition at this point, which is a free ebook, and uh, the print book and the audio book are valid right now. I up I updated those last year. So I try and keep things updated uh, every six months or so. I mean, it's difficult though. I don't, I'm not someone who is teaching how to self-publish anymore. I don't want to do that. Um, you know, I don't want to do screen prints of platforms that change all the time. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, I update it regularly. Oh, Margaret says it's 2 p.m. here as well. <laughs> you guys must be in the US, right, on the East Coast. I hope it's not as hot, hot as it is here. It's super hot. We're having a, a heat wave. Uh, okay. Marie says, my question is about starting an author brand. I'm stuck in analysis paralysis. I'm afraid I'll make branding choices now that will be hard to change in case I change direction in the future. How much of a concern is it to get our branding right from the start? Oh, Marie, I, I hope you've just heard me talk about my own. Okay, so these are already the third set of covers I've done on those books. Um, the, well, well, Ark of Blood, it's difficult when things are behind you. Ark of Blood, Stone of Fire, Crypt of Bone, they were not called those names. <laughs> I did my first three years as a fiction author with using Joanna Penn. Uh, so yeah, what I would say is, look, you just have to start where you are and get on with it and you will change over time. That is an absolute guarantee, <laughs> absolute guarantee. So give it your best shot now with where you are and over time you can uh, change it um, and luckily as indies we get to do this and you know it's not that big a deal yes it might cost you a bit of money down the road but such is life <laughs> so don't worry get on with it <laughs> okay right Kathleen says, I'm using your books for marketing. Okay, this was on relaunching. Uh, my other books have not sold well. Should I start with something new to relaunch? So, did, Okay, so this is an interesting question, not selling well. I would go back to some basics here. So again, my um, those books, uh, they, I don't feel sell well enough for the, the reviews they get. So that would be one question. Do you get good reviews? So are, are other books good? Then um, if they are not, then you could always unpublish them and write some more stuff. But have you worked with an editor, for example? Uh, have you got covers that fit the genre? And then have what have you done for marketing? Because not selling well may mean any of those things, or it might just mean you haven't been able to do effective marketing. And partly the reason I'm changing my covers is because, and I love those covers. I absolutely love them. I'm quite depressed about changing covers. But when I look at the books um, and where they might fit, the covers are wrong for the genre I want to target with marketing. So that's another thing. Uh, so yeah, not selling well could mean a number of things. Bethany. Hello, Bethany. I love your podcast. Thank you so much. How did you start your fiction writing career? What advice do you wish you'd have followed or known when starting? Okay, so you'll find this hilarious. So I started the Creative Podcast, Creative Pen Podcast um, in 2009. And I was realising very quickly that the people I wanted to interview were fiction writers. And I had this website that I'd started that was very much about publishing. But I was like, I really want to learn about writing fiction. And then I did an interview with a guy called Tom Evans, the book right on writer's block. And he basically said to me, I think you've got a block around fiction. And I was like, no, not me. And then I realized I did. I thought that the only valid fiction was Booker Prize winning. And this is partly my education that has, uh, you know, issues with authority and stuff like that. Anyway, so I did started NaNoWriMo 2009 because I was like, no, I'm not going to let this stop me. And then 2010, I did Year of the Novel. I was living in Brisbane in Australia. I did Year of the Novel at Queensland Library. And then I published that in 2011. I published what was Pentecost, what became Stone of Fire. And in terms of what I wish I had done, 
I really, really wish I could have got over my mindset issues earlier. I wish, like Dean Wesley Smith talks about critical voice. I still battle critical voice all the time. And if I had only got rid of that earlier or tackled it earlier, Uh, I could have hit that initial wave. Basically, as the initial Kindle wave of 99 cent millionaires were hitting, I had one book. (laughs) So I wish I could have um, written more faster and got over some of those mindset issues. But all I can say is I'm now trying to get over those mindset issues. (laughs) And we all have a challenge in those, those things. Right, so I hope that helps. Okay. Lisa. Oh, hi, Lisa. Hello. <laughs> Lisa's, Lisa's been on the podcast. Fantastic episode. Uh, what kind of headphones do you use when you record and edit your audiobooks? <laughs> okay. Here's a little thing. I do not use headphones when I record audio. Ah, I know. If you're an audio person, you'll be like, what? How can you hear your own voice? I don't. So uh, all I do is I hit record, I go test, test, I'm testing, I'm just testing, stop, stop, make sure it's recording and then I just record so I never listen to my voice. Um, Yeah, sorry about that. And then in terms of editing the audiobook, I don't even tend to wear headphones then either and if I'm at my laptop, I literally just plug in uh, these, my iPhone headphones. (laughs) Sorry, Lisa, that is totally not the answer you wanted. Or maybe it was, because it just shows you you can do it without special headphones. <laughs> okay. All right. Alexandra says, this is so fun for me. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you're having fun. Uh, Margaret says, we're lovely. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, okay. Laurie says... As a brand new author with only one book one of a series out, would you say the best marketing is just to focus on getting book two out? I struggle with spending more money on ads when the world doesn't know about my work yet. Oh, Laurie, this, you are right. And I think you know you are right. And I know it's hard. I know it's really, really hard. What I would say is what you could do is focus on building your email list in other ways. So uh, yes, getting book two out is a re- it should be your focus, but you could also, um, you know, start to build your email list, for example, with a short story or just um, sign up for my uh, newsletter is, is also fine. So that's uh, something to start with as well. But yeah, basically the reason and I mean if you have loads of budget then great but as Laurie said you know I struggle with spending more money and the thing is even if you can do effective marketing you're not going to get that return so there's almost um little point really uh okay I've totally lost who is or isn't um (laughs) I don't know if this is John or someone else's John. John says, can you talk a bit about Facebook ads? (laughs) That's such an open question. Uh, Okay. I use them. I mainly use them at the moment for, uh, and I'm, look, in general, I do campaign type marketing, but I'm trying to now do Facebook ads, Amazon ads all the time. But usually I do campaign marketing. So with Facebook ads, I will, I'm like, I've got a webinar coming up uh with the lovely nick stevenson and um i think it's the creativepen.com forward slash 16 july but i'll put it in the notes and it'll be on the podcast on monday but essentially um i will use facebook ads to promote that webinar for like two weeks and then i won't do it or if i've got a promotion on a book i will run ads for two weeks and then i'll turn them off i just don't like to monitor ads every day I am trying to slightly change my process because some ads do really well and I probably shouldn't turn them off. But equally, we all have to choose how we spend our time and I don't like to spend my time checking ads. So yeah, but yeah, they are really good. They're still really good. Um, And some people have kind of stopped doing them in terms of other doing other ads, but I think Facebook ads are, are pretty good. Okay. Oh, here we go. Yes, Alexandra says, um, for Elizabeth's spiritual memoir, check out Marion Mace Roach Smith. I loved your recent interview with her. Thank you. I was on Marion's podcast. She's coming on the podcast a week Monday. 
So she came on my show years ago and now she's coming back on again. She's great, Marion. And uh, we'll be talking about writing memoirs. So indeed, that might be useful. Byron says your pro writing aid tutorial is great. So is the tutorial on setting up an author website. Thank you. And do you know what? Next week, it's so funny. Uh, you know, I want to start writing Tree of Life. So Map of the Impossible is with my um, print formatter. I'll be sending it out to my pen friends in the next couple of days. And then I'm pretty much done with that. And so I'm like, I really want to get started on Tree of Life. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. And then I'm like, I need to re-record that author website tutorial. So next week, um, because it's a, it's two and a half years old now and people keep emailing me going, is this still valid? And it is still valid. It's just that because it's older, people are like, oh, that doesn't seem relevant, uh, even though it is. So next week, I have the unenviable task of re-recording tutorials, uh, which I don't particularly enjoy either, but I'm going to do it because, as you say, they are useful. So thank you. I'm so glad you find them useful and uh, more to come. <laughs> OK. Oh, Alexandra also says, love books and travel, especially as an expat. Thank you. I also love books and travel. And part of me is building up books and travel because I have a suspicion that the Creative Pen podcast will change at some point. I'm I'm going to be recommitting for another two years to episode 600. <laughs> but I, I have a feeling that in the next couple of years, I will be changing the format to something. I don't know what I want to do with it, but come on, it's been a decade. <laughs> but uh, books and travel is... Um, at the moment, it's still a passion project, I guess. Oh, thanks, Steve. Says so thanks for all you do. I really appreciate that. I mean, you guys are my community, and I need I need you I need you guys. You know, you're my business, but you're also my community. I like I said, I get really worried. I have I think we all have a level of anxiety, especially right now in the world, to be honest. But um, you guys are my my friends, you know, when we meet at events, we're friends. So that's cool. Okay. Kate says, thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Kate. Could you recommend any entrepreneurship podcast or books you found useful? Uh, okay, so what do I listen to? Oh, goodness. I would say that it, it's totally going to depend on what you're interested in. So obviously, um, like I have the money side, um, the creativepen.com forward slash money books. There's a whole load of books there that are great. And then it's really about what side of entrepreneurship do you need to upskill in? So, for example, I still really rec I recommend Seven Figure Small podcast which used to be the unemployable podcast and there's the unemployable community but the podcast is called seven figure small and it's basically about making seven figures as a small business um which you know i still haven't hit seven figures but hopefully one day i mean in one year uh you know i'd like to do that at some point um but entrepreneurship is such a big topic. So for example, if you wanted to learn about email marketing, there would be specific people there. Um, mindset stuff, different again. Another podcast would be What Works with Tara uh, McMullen. Tara McMullen, she got married. Um, that's another good one. Youpreneur with Chris Ducker. Uh, that's another interesting. Then of course, you've got things like Pat Flynn, Smart Passive Income big one. Um, and then there are, there are lots. I mean, if you start with those and then look in the other things, or if you have Spotify or in fact, Apple updated their podcast app, um, you can now do a lot more searches and better searches for topics. So what I would say is focus down on the particular thing in um, entrepreneurship and uh, find stuff there. Alex says... How can I best tap into an audience beyond my friends and family? I write psychological fiction. Fantastic. Okay, so this is where you need to probably just start with the basics on marketing. And uh, I do uh, I do have a book on how to market a book. Uh, or you can just go to thecreativepen.com forward slash marketing and there's lots of free stuff there that will help. But essentially, nobody just puts a book up on the stores, whatever store, and then it starts selling. It just doesn't work that way. You have to do some marketing. Now that might be 
you know, free marketing. I mean, you, if you, for psychological fiction, for example, you could go to the um, Reedsy, have a really good list of book bloggers. So that might be something for you to do. Go to the Reedsy list of book bloggers and find some book bloggers to talk to. It looks from your picture, if that's you, um, then you're young. Maybe that's your child if you're (laughs) not Uh, but if that is you then um, you know maybe whatever social media you use maybe it's Instagram uh, you know meet some people on Instagram figure out the network for thrillers and uh, you know get into it that way but essentially you have to learn some marketing and there's so much of it I can't give you what is best for you uh you just have to get into it and find the best fit for you and your book okay ah pa kofi that is a lovely picture what a nice smile uh it says hi joanna what ads facebook amazon instagram get you the most return on investment okay so It's not about the platform. It's about what you're doing and what you're marketing. Um, So for example, I could put an ad on Facebook for book one in a 10 book series and the actual ad may not make a return on investment, but a certain percentage of those people will go through and read all the 10 books. Now you could put an ad on Facebook for book one and only have one book, for example, or two books. So of course your return on investment will be less. But then um, Instagram, I have, well, Facebook ads go on to Instagram anyway, so it's not really an issue. But then Amazon, for example, you could be paying per click and then have no conversions. So essentially, look, it's not about the platform, it's what works for you. So uh, I have found, for example, that um, Facebook ads work very well in some circumstances and not well in others. You just have to figure out what works for you and your books and literally, it's so sad, but many people have tried paying others to do it for them and it really just doesn't work. So you have to figure it out. So sorry, I can't give you a specific answer, but you'll have to just see what works for your books. I certainly do all of those though. (laughs) <laughs> All right, how are we doing for time? I said I do 45 minutes and we're already over. So we'll go to the hour and I'll, cause I see there's still so many questions. Oh, Mark Dawson's here. Hi Mark. And talking about ads, Mark, Mark is the, um, the king of ads, the emperor of ads. So um, definitely check out um, Mark, well, the interview I did with Mark actually a few weeks ago was so, super useful. So that might, that might be useful. Okay, let's see where we are. Uh, John says, if I want to record my own audiobook, should I use a studio? Is it expensive? Well, it depends where you are. Um, right now, I don't think you could even hire a studio in the world of the pandemic. Um, so I actually, I'm going to turn my camera. I hope I've not got anything embarrassing on the floor. Here's my studio. There we go. Uh, that's my audio studio in the corner. And basically, it cost me uh, about... 500 pounds in total to build the whole thing and uh, I'll link to it in the show notes but thecreativepen.com forward slash home studio I think it is um, and that's where I do mine and then I hire, hire someone to do to master the audio so I, I don't do that myself but um, ML Buckman, Matt Buckman has a really good book on how to uh, record and edit your own audio book and he talks about all the settings you need so that makes it even more um affordable. Justin says, hello from Louisiana. I have been. So when I went to New Orleans, I also went out on the bayou on a kayak. That was seriously one of my most favorite trips. I just loved being out there. That Those Louisiana wetlands, they're just fantastic. Anyway, welcome. Uh, I'm in the process of writing my first series and have become intrigued with audio. Do you think there is a market for more audiobook producers? Well, yes, Justin, in fact, look, we just had uh, questions there. We've had lots of questions on audio this evening I actually think this is a huge um, niche and missing niche at the moment like I can recommend editors I can recommend cover designers I 
I have no one to recommend with audio other than going with Findaway or with ACX, but a lot of people would prefer to work privately and get work mastered, like I just said, um, and then upload it themselves. So yeah, there's definitely a market. Let me know um, if you do go down that route. Okay, Helen says, here we go. Just, I'm really, I see I'm gonna have to clean up this video. I'm really sweating, it's so hot here. I haven't got my window open. <laughs> mm. Okay, Helen says, another question about second editions. When I put up my new edition on Amazon, should I unpublish the first? Look, to be fair, you can you can unpublish your first edition with ebook, you cannot with print. Your print editions will be there forever. It's a real pain in the neck, to be fair. Uh, so yeah, you do have to unpublish the eBooks. You can um, you can withdraw the audiobooks, but you can never withdraw print because, of course, there's re um, re resale on the old editions. So yeah, there you go. Margaret says both of those outlining books are awesome. Indeed, they are. Okay. Suzanne says, I've been writing some fairly normal non-fiction. Normal non-fiction. <laughs> now I also want to write fiction, maybe fantasy. I think people may be put off. Uh, can you speak to, is it a good idea to have two different author names? Uh, is it hard? Okay, so yes. I mean, obviously I have two author names and um, I think I love it. I really love it. I much prefer having two author names because it keeps things so separate for me. And of course, I'm not hiding it. I'm talking, I talk about it all the time being a JF pen, but it is hard. You do have to maintain separate email lists. You have to do like this tonight. I'm on one page. I'm not on my other page, my JF pen page. So this is for one audience, but then I would get different questions. If I try to combine them, nobody wants to hear, my JF pen readers do not want to hear about self-publishing or book marketing they don't care <laughs> so uh yeah I personally am very happy with two author names but it definitely is um a bit of a bit of extra work uh okay and just just scroll because I'm just aware of the time um oh uh, Byron says why definitely wait for audio when it's your first book mainly budget Look, when, well, two things, budget and also often you will end up re-editing that first book. I just got to tell you, your first book may not be the masterpiece you think it is. Even if you use a professional editor, many people maybe five years later will re-edit it. So yeah, that would be another one. But budget is probably the main reason because most authors do not have a budget for an audiobook straight out the gate. Ah, <laughs> I'm obviously really late on this. Kate says, Omnibus. Byron says, Omnibus. Lynn says, Lynn Worthen. Hi, Lynn. Uh, says, it's an Omnibus. <laughs> yes. When you do a print box set, which is when you put three books in one book, it's called an Omnibus. And Lynn certainly was with me in the US um, on the Oregon coast when Christine Catherine Rush told me this and it still doesn't stick in my head because I just, the word omnibus just doesn't, doesn't work for me. Uh, okay. SV said, oh, here we go. Sorry, I had this. I just discovered story origin. Do you use it? Um, uh, look, to be fair, I have also, um, I have logged into story origin but i have not used it i am starting to use book funnel for the email list stuff and the promotional stuff so i i kind of intend to look at story origin it's just time but i certainly mentioned um, mark dawson earlier the self-publishing formula podcast i know they've had um the story origin i think it's evan uh, on their show uh okay i'm just gonna try and pick people who i haven't heard from so far roseanne says would you suggest completing a whole series first or doing the first book in a few series to see which one resonates okay so um do you suggest a minimum number of in a series so the reason many of us do three books it's not necessarily a trilogy it's mainly for that box set or 
omnibus because many indies can do very well financially with these box sets because you can reduce them and it's still a really good deal. You can get book bub deals on box sets and that type of thing. So I would say, Roseanne, this is, you know, the only you can decide. Hugh Howie was certainly one of those in the early days who wrote, I think he wrote five different novellas, one of which was Wool, which became mega mega hit uh, and he certainly said he wrote different in different genres and then saw which one took off I don't actually know anyone else who's done that I don't know but I mean if you can write that fast go for it uh, it's not something I could do to be fair Julio says, Darn, I wish I could listen in. Well, the replay will be up. Love your channel and your attitude. If you have any tips on finally getting that first manuscript done with all that's going on, let us know. Well, yeah, I think with all that's going on, it's not going to stop. In fact, don't know about you, but I'm in a kind of um, slightly more anxious state right now as it's starting to open up. Um, but in terms of getting it done, listen to the interview I did with Mark McGuinness about a month ago, because I also was going through this difficulty. I just couldn't work, um, couldn't write my fiction, was just all jangled. And then Mark McGuinness came on the show and re he really helped me. And my, my biggest thing was changing my playlist uh, on Spotify. So I now listen to the Game of Thrones soundtrack and literally just by changing my my um, music, it helped me reboot. Um, so that's one tip, um, change your music channel or start listening or whatever. And uh, still put time aside. That's probably the number one tip in general for getting anything done is put some time in your calendar, sit somewhere else in your house where you don't do whatever else you do and listen to different music. So there you go. Uh, okay, lots of people being, <laughs> Linda said, is that, is that a glass of water? No, it's my glass of gin, you missed the beginning. This is a gin and tonic, which is swiftly uh, disappearing. I have, this is an hour, I would normally have at least two gin and tonics, but. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna, I, I will come back in and answer some more of these in the comments, but uh, with five minutes left, I just wanna um, take a question from people I haven't talked to yet. Um, Scott says, I'm starting podcasting. Well done. How, when you started, do you know what your listening numbers were? <laughs> I can tell you they were zero. <laughs> uh, for the first six months, it was like howling into the wind is what I call it. And that will be true for most people. But that's true for most writers. That's true for most YouTubers, true for social media. Uh, it's going to take you um, six months at least of consistent podcasting to get a decent audience. So I'll tell you, Books and Travel right now, even with my existing platform, it's about a thousand downloads per episode, um, which is pretty good for, an, for a, a podcast that's, um, you know, that's not super regular. Uh, how much do you attribute your success to the podcasts? Well, now, uh, you know, in non-fiction, non definitely. In fiction, obviously not. <laughs> um, but with, uh, with non-fiction, yes, definitely podcasting is a core part of my business and my income and my marketing. And I love it. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> Okay, countdown to the hour. Uh, okay, Eric says, great point on critical voice. What steps do you take to overcome that perfectionist? I keep listening to Dean Wesley Smith. He, I've, I've done his stuff on critical voice. I've done his courses. I keep playing him in my head. He's also done some blog posts. He does blog posts on it. Just, um, we'll link to it in the show notes, but Dean Wesley Smith on critical voice, he's the man. But essentially you have to just keep tackling it and going, whatever. And in fact, Mark Dawson, who came on the show, I asked him about that as well. And he's much more hardcore than me and basically said, suck it up, buttercup and get on with it. <laughs> Well, he didn't actually say that, but essentially that's what he meant. <laughs> uh, okay, right. Oh, Rana says, hi, Rana. Lovely to see you. Um, I've been thinking about going wide with my first book um, as I want to reach a wider audience. Is this something you should, you recommend? Okay, what I 
generally would say is if you only have one book, then going wide can be a lot to do. There's so much to do if you're going wide. What I would say is you have to decide what wider audience you want to reach. So for example, going wide with print, not ebook, is a possibility or if you're going to go wide with ebook then think about what do you mean by wider audience um for example do you really want to be in libraries and if you want to be in libraries how are you going to help people order your book in libraries because that's the tip the trick the difficulty <laughs> all right i am falling apart here it's so hot um right okay i am uh, let me just check <laughs> uh, I'm just I'm just having a look yeah uh, I think I'm done <laughs> I think it's all over Red Rover I think I'm falling apart uh, okay right I'm gonna say that this is done and thank you all for coming this evening I will answer some more questions in the on the Facebook page I definitely intend to do another Facebook live again probably next month in July whatever if you haven't signed up for my email list, please go to thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. It is the latest one and uh, I will be updating that soon and doing some more videos. Um, my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash thecreativepen, the Creative Pen podcast. You can find me all over the place. If you um, do, you can also tweet me at thecreativepen if you have any questions. But look, thank you guys for being here this evening. I'm going to go top up my ice <laughs> on the uh, on the gin um so thank you again and uh, happy writing and i'll see you next time bye <laughs>